uh, I read for you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 to 25. Page 29 of the New Testament, uh, if you're using the Pew Bibles. Jesus is speaking to those gathered around him. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early. I don't think I am going as far as verse 25. Actually, sorry, verse 15 it should be. My apologies. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. He went out again to the marketplace at nine o'clock and saw some men standing there doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard and I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. Then at twelve o'clock and again at three o'clock he did the same thing. It was nearly five o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing? He asked them. No one hired us they answered. Well then, you also go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more but they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun, yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the owner answered one of them, I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who was hired last as much as I have given you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I am generous? May God bless the reading of his word to us. A reading from Ephesians chapter 3, starting at... No, Ephesians 3, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ, Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of his grace in the love he showed for us in Jesus Christ. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, And in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Peter. In this service this morning, this sermon this morning, I want to uh, turn to what is a familiar theme to me uh, and what you heard spoken of, uh, particularly by David Shaw at my uh, induction uh, at Skinner Street, if you were there. I want to focus upon the vast uh, and wonderful truth of God's grace. We should begin, really, with a basic question. What is grace? Well, if we look in our dictionaries, we find these definitions. 
It is easy elegance in form or manner. It is favour. It is kindness. It's a short prayer said before or after a meal. It is an ornament consisting of notes additional to the melody or harmony. It is a ceremonial title for a duke, duchess or an archbishop. But we also read that it is divine influence, eternal life or salvation. It is the undeserved mercy of God. And here in those last few definitions, we begin really to truly touch on what grace is and why it's so important to us. And it also speaks to us of what went on at that first Easter. For grace is, despite how awkward it sounds, linked to divine influence and salvation. Salvation was made available at the cross and it was confirmed and sealed at the resurrection. And that salvation was only achieved by and through the divine. But what I most cling to, what thrills me, and what I, what I really want to try and get you excited about, is the fact that grace truly is the undeserved mercy of God. In his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Philip Yancey, the American author, writer and journalist, writes two sentences. And they are, these sentences are to me, two of the most powerful written. I may have already quoted them at some point uh, since I've been here anyway, so they may be a repeat, but it doesn't matter. He says this, he says, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more and there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. Here is the gift of God's grace summed up neatly for us. The love of God is free and is not dependent on anything that we do. That's the first thing that we should rejoice in and be thankful for. That God's love is not dependent on how we live our lives and what we do in our lives. In the Christianity Explored course, the Anglican priest and evangelist Rico Tice describes grace like this. He says, we are more sinful than we ever realised, but more loved than we ever dreamed. We're more sinful than we ever realised, but more loved than we ever dreamed. This is probably the most incredible truth known to us. We, we will have heard it proclaimed by preachers and different people. We, we might even say we agree with it. Yet at the same time, very often, all too often, somehow we do not fully grasp it for ourselves. It's often one of those things we, we hear it and we think, yes, I agree with that. And then when we think of our own lives, we think, really? Can that be true? The late American pastor Mike Iaconelli commented upon this fact in his book, Messy Spirituality. He said, it's amazing how few of us believe in the unqualified grace of God. Oh yes, God loves us as long as we're clean and whole and fixed. But it turns out, he continued, it turns out that the mess of our lives and our crippledness is what most qualifies us to be chosen by Jesus. So why is it that we find God's grace so hard to accept? Well, perhaps it's because we're human. It is hard for us to to believe or to accept anything can be given without any strings being attached whatsoever. And if you've ever been part of a a church uh, outreach thing where you go and just give things to people for no reason, just decide to bless them and give them whatever it might be, people are shocked. People don't know what to do because they expect it to come with strings attached that you're giving me this thing because you want whatever and whenever we do that to people and bless them in that way they are shocked and it's a human condition that we find it difficult to to accept anything that comes without any strings attached whatsoever even in many of our relationships we tend to expect some kind of return for our actions whether it be a gift or love or kindness or friendship 
perhaps it doesn't need to follow in this way, but we do like to receive an acknowledgement of what we've done, at the very least. And this contrasts us with God. If people don't respond to our actions or our love, we can tend to go off them, to like them a little less, even perhaps to stop loving them. And while it's true to say that God also wants us to respond, it's also important to remember, as Philip Yancey explained, that he will never love us any less if we don't. But the real shock of grace is that we should receive the blessing of God's love at all. For as Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in our reading from Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. The result of these facts, the result of this truth, should be punishment. That those who go against God should face the consequences of their actions. Yet we find that this need not be the reality. It's summed up by John in his Gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And as Paul says in that reading from Ephesians, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved. This is the good news that we have to share with the world. We do not face the punishment that we deserve, but we receive mercy as Jesus takes our punishment. For God in Jesus approaches with love. And many people never experience this. No one in society shows them love. They regularly see hate, spite, condemnation but love is something that does not exist for them this is what grace is all about when one's life appears to deserve judgment and condemnation jesus comes bringing compassion and love grace is the most incredible gift a gift that paul expresses in that reading by grace you have been saved through faith And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We need to accept this gift, which we do through placing our faith in Jesus Christ. But there's more to it than that. We also need to act in ways that reflect this gift that we have ourselves received. That is, we need to act graciously. And sadly, there are examples of Christians not acting with grace. All too often, there are examples of Christians not acting with grace. Just think of the parable of the unforgiving servant. It's got great relevance for us as we consider grace. For the first servant in that parable received grace in abundance. You may remember the parable where he owed a great debt to the king. A debt that actually, if you translate it into modern uh, modern money, in our our, um, ways try and work it out in in terms of uh, a day's wage and so on because it's so many denarii denarius is one day's wage he owes so many of those you translate that to what a day's wage would be here under the minimum wage and so on you end up this person owes effectively billions of pounds it's a huge amount and the king wants to punish him for it and the the servant says "No, no no just give me a bit more time i mean it's ridiculous how this goes on just give me a bit more time and i'll pay And the king actually said to him, no, it's all right, I'll wipe your debt. I'll set you free from it. Forgive you. You can go. And we know that servant then goes and meets another servant who owes him but a few pounds and berates him and asks him to pay and he asks for mercy and says, look, give me a bit more time, I'll pay you. And the first servant won't let him. And he throws him in jail to punish him because he can't pay the debt and won't pay the debt. And then the king hears about it, he punishes him for it. How illustrative this parable is of many people. Indeed, how illustrative it is, sadly, of many Christians. You see, so much of what goes on in the world can be described as graceless. 
And I wonder if this is part of what tends to lead people to ask, isn't it enough to do good to get into heaven? Because people outside the church aren't always shown an image of Christians that shows us to be different to the world, to believe in different things and to follow different ways and to act in different ways. All too often, Christians do not manage to stick to the dictum of being in the world, yet not of the world. Philip Yancey states that the single reason that drove him to write his book on grace was hearing the following story that I'll recount to you in a moment from a friend, who works, a friend of his who works in Chicago with those who are down and out. Let me warn you, the story is not a pleasant story. But it does have an important message for us. This is what he writes in his book. The story that a friend shared with him. A prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. (coughs) Through sobs and tears, she told me she had been renting out her daughter two years old, to men interested in kinky sex. She made more renting out her daughter for an hour than she could earn on her own in a night. She had to do it, she said, to support her own drug habit. I could hardly bear hearing her sordid story. For one thing, it made me legally liable being required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea what to say to this woman. At last, I asked if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. I will never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They would just make me feel worse. When the immediate horror of that story has worn off, the thing that sticks in my mind is the terrible indictment that this woman serves on the church. How sad and depressing that someone like her does not feel able to approach the church without fear of condemnation and recrimination. Yet she is not unique. Far too many people who need to receive the grace and love from the church only receive accusations and judgment. We find it easier to suck, to shake our heads and suck our teeth than to try and reach out in love to those who are in need. We're like the early workers in that parable from the the vineyard. We only see injustice according to our standards. We're like the older son in the parable of the prodigal. We only see the bad that has happened. Yes, of course, someone like that woman needs to face justice for what has gone on. And the child needs care and safety. That should go without commenting on, really. That's, that's, that's known. But maybe, just maybe, if that woman had had a different view of the Christian community, then she might have sought help from them before her situation had descended so far. What a contrast all this makes with Jesus. We who claim to be his followers, we who make up his church, drive away the very same sort of people that came running in their droves to see him. This is the grace of God in action. When someone appears to deserve judgment and condemnation, Jesus comes bringing compassion and love. And there's good reason for this. Firstly, people respond so much better to love than judgment. And secondly, if people can be brought to a point where they accept that Jesus can help them, then the Holy Spirit will work to convict them within of their wrongdoing and bring about change in their lives. As followers of Christ, we should show that same compassion and love. The church needs to show grace to the world and to do so proactively. Yes, of course, the world contains things that we should shun from, but it's actions we need to shun, not people. After all, if anyone had reason to recoil from the sinner, it was Jesus. 
Yet he didn't turn away from them. And he doesn't turn away from us either. Rather, he welcomes us all. Seeing and knowing the need for love and healing, he wishes to bring everyone into his fold that they might be made clean. Now, in such circumstances, we often hear the phrase, hate the sin but love the sinner, banded about, as the way that we should act. Yet more often than not, we hate the sinner because of their sin. How far this takes us away from the way that Jesus was. C.S. Lewis used to argue that he could not see what he called the hair-splitting distinction between hating someone's sin and hating the person. How is it possible, he said, to hate what someone does but not hate the person? Then this revelation came to him and he wrote this. He said, It occurred to me that there was one man to whom I had been doing this all my life, namely myself. However much I might dislike my own cowardice or conceit or greed, I went on loving myself. There had never been the slightest difficulty about it. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things was that I loved the man. Just because I loved myself, I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did those things. Lewis simply describes the way in which each one of us manages to act out this apparent paradox in our lives. The difficulty often comes when we try to translate this difference to others. Yet surely it's only by doing so that we will show grace to the world. So how do we show grace to the world? Well, we start by looking to Jesus. We see how he treated people. Often people that we would not be, want to be associated with. But he loved them, he welcomed them, he cared for them. Are we willing to welcome those who are different? Are we willing to love those who do not meet our standards? Are we willing to care for those who are in need? Will we hitch up our robes and run to meet and embrace the penitent sinner before they've had a chance to grovel, just like the father does in the welcoming the prodigal son back? Will we be willing to include those who have not shared in God's mission as long as we have, like the owner of the vineyard included all of the workers. Perhaps seeking to share grace with the world is a big step for us. Perhaps we think it too great a step to make. Perhaps there are steps we need to make closer to home. Do we treat each other with grace as we should? Do we accept that we all make mistakes and slip up from time to time? Or are we quick to frown, to judge, to criticise when people don't do things exactly as we want them to? Perhaps instead of the frown, the judgement and the criticism, we should seek to smile, to accept, to encourage. Perhaps we could try to build up rather than put down. In that way, we might start to truly grow a community of grace. You see, grace is preposterous. Grace makes what is unthinkable and impossible possible. Grace changes lives for the better and grace gives us hope. Grace means that the ways of the world are turned upside down, that those who come to God, whoever they are and however they come, are welcomed and given equal rights in his kingdom. Grace means that we don't have to stick to the letter of the law, but that we have to do what is right in God's eyes. Grace means that we all receive what is good. When we deserve, what we deserve is something entirely different. Grace is a wonderful and marvellous thing and it is our duty to share the grace of God with all people. So let us rejoice in the glory of the cross and the resurrection. Let us acknowledge that we are recipients of God's grace and that we cannot do anything to change God's love for us. And then let us, as we bask ourselves, as we bask in God's goodness, let us seek to show grace to others and draw them to the cross and the empty tomb so that they might experience God's love and grace for themselves. 
Let me finish by quoting words from Carla Iaconelli, Mike's widow, who wrote these words of encouragement in the forward to the book Messy Spirituality. She wrote this, she said, Take heart, my friends, you are in good company. You with all your faults and imperfections, you with your defects and failures, you with your hang-ups and emotional scars, you with your weaknesses and your defeats, you with all your blunders, brokenness and floundering. You are God's beloved, God's favoured, the one Jesus prefers to hang out with, eat with, play with, talk with, cry with, and laugh with. You are the one whom the holy God of heaven and earth longs to spend time with. You are all of this and more. You always have been. And you always will be. May we truly believe and bask in the grace of God. And may we seek to enable others to see it too, to come to know it for themselves. Amen.